I'm Francis Douglas Fane, the former commander of underwater demolition teams of both the Pacific and Atlantic fleets of the U.S. Navy Amphibious Force. Commencing in February of 1948 and continuing for a decade, a series of scientific underwater experiments were conducted and filmed for historical record by pioneer photographer E.R. Fenimore Johnson. Some people have asked me why I became a deep sea diver. My reason was purely practical. I owned a 54 foot yacht with twin engines which drove her 27 knots. This speed would suck up fishermen's lines and nut lines from the bottom and they would get wound around my propellers. That forced me to hail passing yachts and request that they send a tugboat to tow me back to a shipyard. One day I read an advertisement of an invention by two men named Miller and Dunn. It was a copper helmet which could be put on without using a diving suit. And this helmet was supplied by an air hose from the surface. I bought one of these helmets, and thereafter I was able to go overboard, and with my knife I would chop away the lines that were wound around the propellers. <laughs> My name is E.R. Fenimore Johnson. In 1929, this underwater camera was developed, and it has all of the controls that a surface camera have. I conducted work in the vicinity of the dry tortugas, uh, testing many filters and exposures the Society of Motion Picture Engineers heard of my work and requested me to write a scientific paper. I wrote this paper, which is entitled Undersea Cinematography. The paper established my reputation as a man capable of performing original scientific research. At the end of uh, World War II, I was granted the rank of Lieutenant Commander in the United States Naval Reserves. I was uh, interested in the underwater demolition teams and I requested that I take my two weeks annual training at the Little Creek amphibious training station in Virginia. I was granted this privilege. I then met Lieutenant Commander Francis Douglas Fane. Later, he became a full commander. He instructed me in the use of this unit, which is called a La Rue. Uh, it is an underwater oxygen rebreathing apparatus which has the great advantage of not showing any bubbles at the surface. Unfortunately, it is not possible to dive deeper than 30 feet because within a few minutes after going below the level of 30 feet, a person goes into convulsions and promptly dies. 
recognized the need of some method of proving uh, what we did to higher officers of the Navy who could not go into the water with us and see what we were doing. I prayed for a camera for devices which would, would record our unique missions. Then one day, as if by a telepathic call, I received word from the Chief of Staff of the Naval Amphibious Force in Little Creek, Virginia, that a strange man was in their office. He says he can take photographs underwater. Well, I just about jumped out of my pants. I ran out, jumped in my Jeep, got a Marine guard, and we dashed over to the offices of the uh, four striper. And he said, Fane, there's your man. He's a tall, gaunt, uh, peculiar looking fellow. When I uh, reported to Commander Fane, I was six feet two inches tall, weighed 206 pounds, and there was no fat on me. I was in splendid physical condition because it was my custom to walk and run three to five miles per day or swim for an hour. Therefore, I had no difficulty in performing all of the things that uh, was required of an underwater demolition team officer. Some years later, after performing this exceedingly strenuous duty and keeping up with youngsters in their 20s, I became skinny and then lost the strength so that I could not swim in front of the young men as an underwater demolition team officer is required to do. The uh, documentary film which you are about to see was taken by Commander Fain and I. We were seated in the forward seats of uh, a fleet type submarine. The drawback to this large camera is that you cannot swim while taking motion pictures. Therefore, I had developed a smaller camera which had the great advantage of operating all of the controls by the thumbs and the position of the filter and the speed, etc was visible on dials inside of this camera. Uh, in addition to taking underwater motion pictures, it was important to obtain still pictures. And therefore, after several experiments, this uh, very compact still camera was developed in which the controls were uh, visible only on the front. And that completed the uh, development of underwater photographic equipment, excepting that uh, concurrently with the development of the cameras, we developed uh, light meters and range finders. <laughs> Uh, 
I very much wanted to become an underwater demolition team officer. Unfortunately, I was too old, being 53 years old at the time. Therefore, I was obliged to accept the position of a scientific advisor and uh, director of underwater motion pictures. There uh, were unanswered questions about light underwater. Therefore, I caused to have developed an underwater spectrograph. This was taken down to the floor of the sea and uh, pointed in various directions and the uh, split up light beams were recorded on film. We therefore learned that uh, ultraviolet light does not penetrate. And we found that the light which penetrated the more turbid water was 7,000 angstrom units, which is very close to the invisible red light. This additional information made it possible to improve the performance of the underwater photographers. underwater camera was uh, able to change lenses underwater so that you could use a telephoto or a wide-angle lens. But it was, of course, much too heavy to walk around with and had to be used from a tripod. This is a prototype of an underwater still camera. And then the underwater still camera was simplified to this type, which uh, had, in addition, a flash bulb. Of course, it was necessary to establish the distance to an object, so this uh, underwater range finder was developed. Sometimes supplementary light was necessary. We had underwater lamps. And we developed three types of underwater exposure meters. The first one worked. It was uh, quite simple. The second one was more complete. And the last one told the photographer everything about exposure that he wanted to know. For instance, when you change lenses, uh, it would be necessary to change the exposure, too.
entrance through a submerged submarine's torpedo tube was another historical first for the underwater demolition teams. I could not risk the possibility of one of my men being injured in, in uh, all likelihood in this uh, experiment, which had never been done before. So I gave her a try myself. The submarine torpedo tube was only 21 inches in diameter. I could just get into it. It was not possible for me to have my hands uh, anywhere but close to my chest so that I could reach the valve of my lung and make a tapping signal on the metal tube. It was quite a feeling to go into this constricted space to watch the outer door of the tube close and be in pitch blackness for the entire experiment, which only took a couple of minutes. But those couple of minutes felt like sitting in an electric chair and asking the man to pull the switch, which is exactly what I did when I tapped four times on the casing of that tube. At, the, at that moment, the submariners inside blew down the tube with a heavy gust of compressed air. This blew the water out of the lower level of the tube and left me uh, like a limp rag inside. In fact, I bounced around for a few moments as the, as the water was in great turbulence. And my face mask was ripped off my face. I couldn't breathe. And my, the bayonet valve and the lambents and lung triggered. So there I was, a poor helpless rag, limp rag. However, as soon as the tube was dry, they opened the inner door, and I could see the faces of the torpedo men inside the hull of the submarine. <laughs> Emancipation rides majestic through our nation, bearing on its trains a story. Liberty, a nation's glory. Roll it along, roll it along, roll it along through the nation. Freedom's power, emancipation. Roll it along, roll it along, roll it along through the nation. Freedom's power, emancipation. Just 
training men for hazardous duty, my dictum was, a UDT cadre will never have higher duties than the safety of his fellow swim buddy. I told them, if you don't return from an assignment with your fellow man, don't bother to come back at all. To enforce this rule in night swims and in hazardous areas, pairs of UDT swimmers were tethered together by a stout cord. I told Bureau of Personnel Mabobs, give me your cast-offs, your misfits. Should these men have a spark of manhood, a desire to redeem themselves, I'll ignite it. Myself, I faced the ignominy of General Courts Marshal for accidents that occurred, and I knew and learned how to make amends with my fellow men. Fleet Admiral Richard Kelly Turner a valiant amphibian of World War II, who often had UDT under his command, said of them, in reference to my book, The Naked Warriors, does the reader hold the view that young American men are soft, timid? Well, here's a tale of those who are not. Volunteers all. They knew that heavy combat losses were inevitable, and many more volunteers came forward than were needed. They never failed us. Hail!